Why does the president of Germany decide to appoint Adolf Hitler as the chancellor? That's what this video is all about. In this video, we're going to be discussing some of the characters that play a really, really crucial role in Hitler becoming the Chancellor of Germany. It's probably one of the single most complicated bits of the entire rise of the Nazis and might take me a little bit of time to explain and go through in some depth. Um, a number of things I'm going to be referring to in this video, um, I have sort of covered at least the concepts and the big ideas and the processes and the systems in earlier videos in this course. And if you have a route around on my channel or in the playlist, you should be able to find them if you want a, a quick recap on them. If you're new to the channel, hello there, my name is Tom, I'm a history teacher from the UK, and therefore I make videos about history. If you've got any questions about anything I say in this video, please bang them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them, or someone might be able to answer them and get there before I do. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the process by which Hitler does actually become the Chancellor of Germany, it's important for us to understand and become familiar with three men who are very, very important in Hitler's rise. The first of these men is the President of Germany at this time, Paul von Hindenburg. Paul von Hindenburg is a retired general. So he basically was brought out of retirement to be in charge of all of Germany's forces in the First World War fighting Russia on the Eastern Front. He's a massive war hero. He's also very, very conservative and very, very old. He's 84 years old at this point. Um, and he basically wants Germany to sort of go back to a similar system that it was ruled under during the First World War and before the First World War with the Kaiser as the Emperor. He doesn't necessarily want to bring the Emperor back. He doesn't necessarily want to bring the Kaiser back. It's wrong to say Hindenburg wants the Kaiser back. But he wants a similar system. And what's similar about the system? Well, basically, it's a country that is run by the rich, by the aristocrats, who he thinks kind of know what they're doing. They're conservatives. He doesn't like democracy. He thinks democracy has, has been a very, very bad experiment for Germany. He blames it for a lot of the problems that Germany has faced. And fundamentally, his goal is to try to leave Germany in safe hands. He realises he hasn't got very long left and he wants to make sure the handover to whoever takes over is going to be very, very good and, and, and lead to a, a, a prosperous, powerful Germany in future. The second chap that we need to be familiar with is a man called Kurt von Schleicher. Kurt von Schleicher is a general in the German army. He's a particularly important general and he's more than 30 years younger than Hindenburg. And what this means is that um, he is, is deeply, deeply interested in trying to keep this, trying to create this new system, this new um, aristocratic, possibly, possibly dictatorship um, alive as an idea in Germany and try to make it come to power. That's what he's looking for. He's known for being very clever, very wily. He's known for playing people, being what we might call quite Machiavellian. He's not very widely trusted. The third guy we need to be familiar with is a man called Franz von Papen. Franz von Papen is also a conservative like von Schleicher and von Hindenburg, um, but he's not a, a general. He's not had a particularly, um, a, he doesn't define himself by his military parts. He doesn't wear military uniforms all the time and stuff like that, although he had been in the military. He's known for being quite stylish and ultimately, and um, people regularly underestimate him. A lot of people think he's a bit dim, he just looks good, looks quite quite handsome and stylish, whatever, but there's not really much going on up there. Whereas in reality, he's actually a razor sharp political operator. We also need to be a bit familiar with how the Weimar Republic's political system works. So firstly, we need to remember that they use what's known as proportional representation to elect their parliament. What that means is instead of there being two big parties uh, and one of the big parties normally beating the other party, like in the United States or in the United Kingdom, what tends to happen is you get a parliament with a whole range of different political parties in it um, and none of those political parties regularly has a majority of the seats. They're often miles off a majority and have to work together to form coalition governments. Now, the person who's in charge of the government is the Chancellor. They have a cabinet of ministers that help them, about a dozen people who run different parts of the country, um, like for example the roads or the army um, or the police or stuff like that. Now, the um, Chancellor is picked by the President. The president is a little bit like the monarch of Germany. So in the UK, if we had a president, we would not have a queen. Um, what basically happens is in the UK today, the person um, who becomes prime minister is almost always the person who's in charge of the largest political party. Um, and the queen has virtually no say in who the prime minister is going to be. However, in Germany at this point, the president does have quite a bit of influence and can pick kind of who they want to be the chancellor. However, the chancellor can be removed from office if the parliament, if the Reichstag, 
votes against them. If that vote is called, that vote is called a vote of no confidence, and if 51% of the members of parliament, the deputies of the Reichstag, vote against the chancellor, they can remove the chancellor from office, and the president has to find somebody else to be in charge, okay? Finally, um, the president has a special power known as Article 48. It's called Article 48 because it's the 48th article uh, in the Weimar Republic's constitution. And this allows the president, with the click of their fingers, to make a law if they want to. Normally the way that laws are made is they have to go to the Reichstag and 51% of the MPs, of the deputies of the Reichstag, have to vote in favour of it to become a law. That's the most democratic way of doing it, if you think about it, rather than one person just randomly saying they're going to make a law. But nonetheless, what this means is that if the Chancellor is struggling to get laws through, the Chancellor um, can't get 51% of the, the, the deputies of the MPs to back the laws, the Chancellor can go to the President and say, look, can you write this into law for me? And the President can if they agree to do so. It is a bit democratic because the President is still elected. It's not completely a complete dictatorship, but it's far less democratic than the Parliament voting upon it. So phase one of Hitler becoming the Chancellor of Germany. There are three phases, we'll go through them. This is phase number one. It begins when Franz von Papen is appointed the Chancellor of Germany by von Hindenburg on the 1st of June 1932. Von Papen inherits a pretty diabolical situation. Firstly, he's got a massive economic crisis that the country is really struggling to deal with and he's inherited that from the previous governments who've just been unable to get control of things. Secondly, he's got a Reichstag that doesn't like him. The Reichstag uh, will not basically um, vote through any of his plans or his policies. He tries to cobble together a coalition government of lots of different political parties, but even then he can't get one that has 51% of the MPs backing him. It's an absolute and complete nightmare. So he does regularly go to um, President von Hindenburg and he says, look von Hindenburg, can you please put my law through using Article 48? And Hindenburg kind of reluctantly does this. Many historians say this is actually really the time when democracy dies in Germany, way before Hitler comes to power. Because at this point, um, laws are being made effectively by a small group of men um, who are signing them off. They cease to be democratic. The organs of, of the democracy of Germany, like the Reichstag, are failing. They're giving up. And therefore, if Germany's like a person, um, the person is starting to die. Now, um, basically what happens, von Papen realises that the only way that he's probably going to be able to get lots of his laws through and stuff like that is if he brings the Nazis into a coalition government with him. Now, um, he knows he's not going to be able to work with the communists because he's a conservative and he's on the right. So the Nazis are really the only people he can turn to. And they've got a large number of um, deputies of the Reichstag at this point, And therefore, he's going to have to try and find some way to work with them. What he decides to do, he talks to von Hindenburg and they decide that they're going to offer Hitler the vice chancellorship. Now, Hitler is, is um, invited to meet them. And when he hears this, he completely flatly refuses it. And um, there are kind of two reasons for this. Firstly, he refuses it because of the Führer Prinzip. The Führer Prinzip, remember, is that idea that um, the Nazi party is basically a dictatorship with Hitler at the top of it. And it's trying to create this sort of mystical idea that Hitler is some kind of prophet or guide. Now, if Hitler wants to create, him, you know, create this image of him as the leader, it doesn't really work very well if he's someone else's deputy in the government. That doesn't really fit very well. So he doesn't want to do that. He thinks it'd be really, really bad for how it makes him look. Um, at the same time, Hitler realises he's actually got quite a bit of power. Because if he wants to, he can call a vote of no confidence. Lots of the other political parties will probably join him and bring down von Papen's government. So actually, although he doesn't have a position in the government at this time, he's not president, he's not chancellor or anything like that, he has a lot of power because if he wants to, with a click of his fingers, he can pretty much destroy von Papen's government. So things, things aren't, aren't really good for von Papen here at this point. Um, now, when, um, he, when Hitler turns around and rejects the vice chancellorship and demands to be chancellor, Hindenburg is very, very annoyed. And Hindenburg privately remarks that he would make Hitler the postmaster general. The postmaster general is the person who's in charge of all the post in the country, the mail, the letters, the parcels, all of that stuff. And the reason why is he says, to, to, his, to, to a person um, with him, Hindenburg says, that would mean that Hitler could lick stamps with my face on. And when he licked stamps with my face on, he'd be licking my behind. Now, anyway, um, Hindenburg really, really doesn't like Hitler. Hindenburg actually refers to Hitler as the Bohemian 
corporal, which is a clever play on words. Um, Hitler comes from Austria, but he comes very close to where the Czech Republic is now today. And the Czech Republic at this time was referred to as Bohemia. At the same time, Bohemia, um, uh, being Bohemian at this point in history, meant being like we describe a hippie today. Someone with sort of a head in the clouds, a bit airy-fairy, not really with a good grip on things. Also, by using the term corporal, um, and Hindenburg being this guy who's been in command of the entire German army and very posh, he's kind of looking down on Hitler. There's a degree of snobbishness to it. Anyway, basically at this point, um, there are some strict rules about the Nazis. The government has got obviously scared by the Nazis for obvious reasons, and what they have done is they've put severe limitations on the um, what the SA can do, and severe limitations on the Nazis on the radio. They're not allowed to broadcast on the radio, or go on the radio, or stuff like that. Hitler says, to kind of turn the situation on its head slightly, he says he will not bring down von Papen's government, provided von Papen gets rid of these restrictions. Von Papen, kind of realizing that he's beaten and he's sort of a Hitler's mercy, agrees to do this. Now at this point, everything starts to backfire for von Papen quite badly. Von Papen's strategy, ultimately, is to try to use the Nazis. He wants to use the Nazis to get legislation through. If he gets legislation through, that will probably be able to fix the economic crisis, get the, get the most severe, most controversial stuff done, um, and get people um, who are voting Nazi to be a bit happier. If that then occurs, he expects the Nazis to reduce in popularity, which there's, I think, a significant chance that might have happened. Um, and what that would have mean is that Adolf Hitler would have been a kind of a footnote in history that no one's ever really heard of. That was von Papen's strategy. Anyway, nonetheless, he realizes the situation and he gets rid of those anti-Nazi laws. But actually, that was a very, very silly move on his part because they were the only thing that was stopping Hitler destroying von Papen's government because von Papen was gonna give way on it. So what happens, a few weeks later, the communists put forward a vote of no confidence and Hitler rubs his hands together and says, yes, I'm gonna vote for it, I'm bringing you down von Papen. So Hitler completely backstabs von Papen, despite von Papen giving him this thing, Hitler completely backstabs him. There's a vote of no confidence in the Reichstag and an overwhelming majority, more than 90% of the deputies of the Reichstag vote for no confidence in von Papen's government. That then triggers a general election in November 1932. Now, the election in 1932 doesn't ultimately change anything very much. It's a bit like um, a card game where there's been a set of cards dealt out. They're all really rubbish cards. They will deal again. And they're also a really set of rubbish cards. The Nazis lose a little bit of their support in the Reichstag. They drop from about 38% to about 35% of the MPs. But they're still the largest party. Uh, and fundamentally, things haven't changed very much. Now, um, basically what von Papen realises is the situation in Germany is really getting out of control. Um, now, he has von Schleicher, Kurt von Schleicher the general, in his cabinet. Kurt von Schleicher is his minister of defence. And actually, Kurt von Schleicher was very good friends with von Hindenburg and actually convinced von Hindenburg to put von Papen as chancellor in the first place back in June. Now, von Papen decides the only way he can deal with this situation is to declare martial law. What does this mean? Martial law basically means the army become the police and everybody in the country is subject to the laws that soldiers are subject to. The laws that soldiers are subject to are far, far stricter than the laws that ordinary people are subject to. And at this point, there's a lot more offences, for example, that carry the death penalty and stuff like that. You'd probably found strict curfews. Um, you would have had like the SA being disarmed and stuff like that, having the guns taken off them. Um, and essentially, von Papen kind of wants to almost create a little bit of a dictatorship with this, himself at the head of it. That's the only way he can see out of this crisis. Now, what von Schleicher does is von Schleicher at this point really doesn't like uh, von Papen, thinks he's pretty rubbish, and von Schleicher comes to the conclusion that he himself could do the job better. So when von Papen suggests this idea of declaring martial law, von Schleicher basically has a survey done, some research done in the German army, and the research says there is no way that they could successfully implement martial law. Basically because the German army at this point is 100,000 men strong. The communists by themselves, the communists have their own kind of, of stormtroopers, their own heavies, their own soldiers, called the Rotfront. The Rotfront alone has 100,000 men in. And then on top of that, the Nazis have nearly 500,000 stormtroopers. So you're looking at potentially the German army being out, outnumbered uh, six to one if they tried to install martial law and the SA and the Rotfront decided to rebel against the government. So von Schleicher presents this and it basically ruins von Papen. Von Schleicher goes to um, von Hindenburg and says he needs to go. And do you know who'd be great for the job? You know, yours truly. So that's what von Schleicher does. And what this means is that on the 3rd of December 1932, von Schleicher replaces von Papen as Chancellor of Germany.
Now this begins phase two of Hitler becoming Chancellor of Germany. It's a little bit faster here. So essentially what happens is um, von Papen is sacked and he is livid at von Schleicher and he thinks von Schleicher has completely backstabbed him. What von Papen decides to do is kind of still try to carry out his strategy of using the Nazis to fix the problem in, in Germany so they can become a bit of irrelevance. So what he does is he actually approaches Hitler on the 4th of January 1933. What he does is he has a secret meeting with Hitler and he says this, he says, right, von Schleicher has still got all of the problems that I had as Chancellor. He's still got an economy that is, is in a terrible situation and he's got a Reichstag that won't allow him to pass any of the legislation that he needs to get the job sorted. So although it's a different man in there, he's facing the same almost insurmountable problems that I faced. This means that he might be actually relatively easy to get booted out. Now, what von, von Papen basically gives to Hitler is his plan and he says, right, I will become Vice-Chancellor, you will become Chancellor. But you will need to have a lot of people around you who are Conservatives for von Hindenburg to accept the plan. Von Papen then says, if you back me on this plan, Hitler, I will work to convince von Hindenburg to kick out von Schleicher and replace von Schleicher with yourself. Hitler agrees to this strategy. Hitler is happy to become Chancellor, even if he's not a particularly strong one. He's happy to become Chancellor at this point. So what happens, von Papen goes and approaches von Hindenburg and basically causes lots and lots of problems with von Schleicher and turns around and says von Schleicher's rubbish, he's terrible, all of this stuff. This is not helped by the fact that von Schleicher is also a really quite ill man. Um, we think at the time he had anemia um, and therefore he's struggling with all the stresses of the job that he's doing. Furthermore, everyone has kind of seen what he's done to von Papen and a lot of people do not trust him whatsoever. He also regularly criticised in public his political allies. He would tell jokes about them and stuff like that. And he famously told a joke once about Paul von Hindenburg's son, really criticising him. So within the space of a few weeks, what basically happens is von Hindenburg actually starts to turn against von Schleicher because he's not solving the problems and he's not very likeable and he doesn't look like he's likely to sort this problem out. And with von Papen saying, look, make me the vice chancellor, Hitler the chancellor, and then I can control Hitler, von Hindenburg. I will control him. And that's how we'll get this stuff sorted. So von Hindenburg reluctantly agrees. And this is the third and final phase of Hitler becoming Chancellor. On the 30th of January, 1933, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany by von Hindenburg, but with von Papen as his Vice Chancellor. Now at this point, the cabinet of Germany has about 12 jobs within it. Um, essentially what happens is the Nazis are allowed only two jobs in that cabinet. They're allowed uh, the Chancellorship, and they are allowed the Ministry of the Interior, like the, the Home Secretary, um, uh, basically being in charge of the police and stuff like that. All of the other jobs, all of the other jobs are controlled by Conservatives. Even though the Nazis are the biggest party in the Reichstag, they are all controlled by Conservatives. The idea of this is that Hitler will be Chancellor, but be a very weak Chancellor. And the strategy that von Papen has and von Hindenburg is the same. Hitler will be used and then discarded when the crisis is over. And very few people will ever know the name Adolf Hitler in future. That is that plan will go awry. Well, we'll talk about that in the next video. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, I politely ask you to share it and to like it uh, so that other people benefit from it too. And I will see you next time where I'll explain where, how things all begin to get out of hand for these conservatives who've had this strategy and how Hitler goes in the space of a few weeks from being a very weak chancellor to being one of the most powerful politicians in all of Germany. See you there, toodle pip.